to you all. Um, uh, Alex de Baal has been for 30 years uh, an expert on the Horn of Africa, did his PhD on Darfur, has been senior advisor to African Union, United Nations and many organizations, institutions. Um, his expertise includes uh, Ethiopia and Somalia, and his latest book just out this year is on pandemics past and, and present, um, uh, new pandemics, old politics, 200 years. Uh, he has also done work on famine and typically the disaster relief industry, which I think is familiar in Africa, but also in India, there's this wonderful book, Everybody Loves a Good Drought by Sainat. Um, his work on the Horn of Africa concerns what we could call, um, because when you're in the Peace Institute business, you do not have to be soft in the head, as he recently explained, um, real politics, which is the political marketplace with their power brokers, processes of negotiation. And here is a correction for some of us, including myself, not institutions. And one of the variables is the management of kleptocracy, whether it is well done or whether it is clumsy. In the case of South Sudan, it was a bit clumsy. Um, so this teaches us about the relationship between political marketplace, governance and development. And uh, I would urge you, I would advise you, um, I'll put it in a chat later or in an announcement, watch the YouTube 2016 at Peace Institute uh, with Alex as speaker, War and the Business of Power in the Horn of Africa, because it's, it's, it is riveting uh, and instructive. Uh, Alex, it's a great pleasure to, to host you, uh, Mark Duffield also, um, and all of you. Um, I have been following your work since the 80s, 90s, and I've always found it very, um, very profound and very cutting. It has an edge. Alex, thanks for joining us, please. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you, everybody. And it's 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 nice to be here. That would be it would be even better to be in to be meeting in person. Um, so I'm, I want to talk about what what's happening in the Horn of Africa, and my basic thesis is going to be that there is a, a tide of transactional politics that has overtaken and is actually drowned out what we might call the Pax Africana, which are the norms, principles, and institutions which were somewhat fragile, but nonetheless real, developed by the, the African Union um, in the first decade of this century. And also what we might call the Pax Ethiopica, the sort of the regional uh, hegemony of, of, of the Ethiopian state in, in the Horn. Um, I'm going to assume that you're all basically familiar with the geography, politics, and history of the Horn and not go into any, any very much detail on, on that. Um, I would make just a few points by, by way of introduction. One is, one is that the, the Horn of Africa, um, when I started working on it in the 1980s, it consisted of three large countries, that is Sudan, uh, Ethiopia and Somalia, plus the little enclave of Djibouti, um, which I won't really talk about very much. But um, in the period that I've been working on it, these three large countries have become five and de facto six. So um, uh, Ethiopia split into Ethiopia and Eritrea in 91. Somaliland had de facto secession from Somalia in the same year, and then South Sudan became independent um, in 2011. And the fact that this, this is a region that is prone to separatism, to state partition, recognized and unrecognized, um, is, is itself very significant. It points to the, mm. the, um, some of the, 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 the fundamental unresolved issues within the region. 
Um, in addition to which, the, um, there's some very interesting ele elements in the Ethiopian constitution that was adopted in 1994, um, um, well, drafted in 94, adopted in 95, the constitution of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. And although the, the current Ethiopian prime minister really, um, Abiy Ahmed has, you know, from the outset, has made it clear he wants to revise that. He wants to go back to a unitarist um, constitution. He hasn't managed to do that yet um, and may not manage to uh, at all. And that constitution is very interesting because, I mean, if you read, let's say, the, you know, the solemn declarations of the African Union Peace and Security Council, which met on Monday for the first time on Ethiopia, one year after the war broke out, and they talk about sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity. And similarly, you know, that is a, a mantra that is routinely expressed by all international players. If they actually went and read the Ethiopian constitution, they would see that the preamble to the constitution starts, we, the nations, nationali nationalities, and peoples of Ethiopia coming together and then Article 8 of the Constitution defines sovereignty, and it says that sovereignty belongs to the nations, nationalities, and peoples, and that the Ethiopian territory is the assembly of the territories of the different national regions of Ethiopia. So the, 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 the casual assumption that, of, that, that um, legitimacy, authority, sovereignty are vested in the the central uh, national executive in the case of Ethiopia is actually not true. Um, and, and, and this may actually indeed in, in, in the coming years prefigure the, the, the breakup of Ethiopia, which is something that I think most people do not want to see. And, and certainly the, the current government in Ethiopia would be absolutely, totally opposed to. Um, if you, um, and the reason for the, I mean, the historical background that gives rise to this, this anomaly is that Ethiopia is uh, an indigenous land empire. There are not that many land empires of a comparable nature in place around the world. Um, but historically, the, you know, the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire was one, the Ottomans were another, and Ethiopia um, is indeed another. The Nile Valley, arguably, was another. And, and, one, and, and, and there are elements of that type of imperial state that exist um, in, in, in the greater Sudan, the North, North and South Sudan. Um, and, 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 and thus, in the, in the African context, the Horn of Africa is unusual in that the, the colonial order was superimposed upon an indigenous political order that had these elements of, of uh, imperialism or, 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 or colonial conquest. And the Somali state is not that. The Somali state is actually a, a sort of counter to that, an attempt to, 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 to establish a, a nation state out of a, an identity that had been uh, conquered, subjugated by, by uh, a combination of its neighbor in Ethiopia and the European imperial powers. So that is by, um, by way of, of, of background. And I think this helps to explain why the uh, uh, ethnic factor, the ethnic identity factor across the region is, is peculiarly complex and, 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 and very deeply fraught. It invokes very, very strong uh, emotions, historical memories, agendas, and fears. Um, I'd be happy to talk more about some of the, 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 the historical elements in, 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 in the Q&A. Let me move on to, to um, what I'm going to sort of portray as the backdrop, the, as it were, the, the more hopeful period of about 20 years ago. Um, and that being hopeful is, in this region is always relative at every time there's been extreme violence. And, 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 and considerable repression. But what we saw um, in at the turn of the millennium in Africa as a whole 
was a sense that the, the continent had looked into the abyss. It had seen the evils and horrors of um, genocide in Rwanda, of a continental war in, in, in Congo, of recurrent coups d'etat and military takeovers and repressions. And uh, in the 1990s, the continent had been neglected by the powers that be. And that was actually in many ways a blessing. It was better to have no external interference and, to, and for the African uh, nations essentially to be left to their own devices for a period. And out of this emerged a whole series of African initiatives to get to grips with the ills that had beset the continent. And um, one of them of particular significance was, was, was the work of the Sudanese stroke South Sudanese scholar diplomat Francis Deng, who coined the term sovereignty as responsibility. And that actually partly grew out of the experience of Ethiopia in the 1980s, when there was a terrible famine in the north of Ethiopia uh, associated with the, the civil war. And the then Mangistu government insisted that uh, hum essential humanitarian assistance should only be provided to the suffering populations on terms that it, the sovereign government of Ethiopia, laid down. So it prohibited assistance to people living in the areas held by insurgent groups, including the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, and the Eritrean uh, resistance too. And in response to that, which was obviously uh, an offense against um, basic human sensibility. Um, the, there was an outcry. Um, the United States and other donors began to support a cross-border relief operation. Mark knows this well. He uh, co-authored a book on it. And after the fall of the, the military regime in 1991, there was a great sense that this should never be allowed to happen again. And sovereignty should never be an obstacle to the provision of essential life-saving humanitarian assistance. And Francis Deng developed this concept, which is really the forerunner of the responsibility to protect. And it went through a particular African route in response to the, uh, the Rwanda genocide and the panel of eminent personalities set up to study Rwanda, actually, interestingly enough, at the instigation of the then Ethiopian government. Um, which coined the principle of non-indifference. We cannot be indifferent to war crimes, crimes against humanity, starvation in a neighboring country. So this principle emerged and it was enshrined in the Constitutive Act of the African Union. There were others too, and I won't go into them, uh, but I would mention the, the intolerance of a coup d'etat, the hostility to an unconstitutional change of government take over by the military, which became revised at the time of the Arab Spring to recognize that when a, a constitutional but autocratic regime is overthrown by, by popular uprising, the African Union should welcome that, but should demand that that uprising results not in a new military rule, but in a true transition to, to democracy. And quite remarkably, the African Union actually suspended Egypt in 2013 when Al Sisi took over as an unconstitutional change of government. Quite right, too. <coughs> um, two other principles I'll mention in, in the sort of the Pax Africana. Um, uh, one of, of them is the, the principle that emerged uh, more out of practice than out of, of, of articulation in the Constitutive Act of the African Union. Sorry, I should have said for those of you unfamiliar with the history of the Continental Organization, the Organization for, of African Unity, which was a sort of trade union of heads of state, on a, accomplishing its, its historic mission, which was in ridding the continent of colonial and, and apartheid rule on the accomplishment of that in 1994 with the achievement of, of democratic rule in South Africa, began to shift to be a, the African Union, which was much more attentive to the, the failings of, of the, the internal failings of the African continent itself. Um, and the, um, so the, 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 um, one of the principles it adopted was the, 
the duty of offering and accepting good faith mediation. So it is now standard practice for African mediators to step in immediately if there's a conflict. And a very striking example of this is the wars in South Sudan. So the, the first civil war in South Sudan, which started in 1955, it raged for 10 years before there was any Sudanese effort to resolve it. And it raged for 16 years before there was an international effort to resolve it, which led to a peace agreement in 1972. The second civil war, which broke out in 1983, there was some domestic efforts after about three, two, three years. And, but the first international effort had to wait to 1991, and it wasn't really properly underway for another couple of years. So it took about eight years. When civil, and that resulted in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement of 2005. When civil war broke out in South Sudan in December of 2013, the, um, the, the foreign ministries of the neighboring states and representatives of the African Union and the Northeast African Organization, IGAD, Intergovernmental Authority on Development, accompanied by the UN, they were there within a week. It took them one week to begin to respond. Now, one can criticize their response, but the fact was immediate, no sooner had, had, had the conflict erupted than there was an attempt, and that has to be pro. Um, and, 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 and one can see this pattern um, across the continent. I mean, the Ethiopian civil war is, is a bit of an exception. Um, but that is the basic, um, um, the basic pattern. Um, and then the, the last point, which, is, um, which was a, a, a norm that was articulated um, and passionately, especially by the um, then South African president, Thabo Mbeki, is the principle of, of respecting diversity, of uh, the governance of African countries at heart being the question of how you govern diversity. And, 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 and the recognition of, of, of you know, multiplicity of identities um, as, as intrinsic to the nature of, of, of Africa. And it's very striking. Um, uh, um, Thabo Mbeki was, was the African Union um, representative to, to help facilitate the separation of Sudan and South Sudan in 2010, 2011. I was part of his team. And he gave lectures in Khartoum and in Juba on the eve of the referendum of January 2011, which led to South Sudan becoming independent. And his core message um, to, in, in both of them was that when Sudan separates, it does not separate into an African country and an Arab country. It separates into two African countries, each of which is characterized by diversity and the central governance challenge of each of them being to manage diversity. And this was, and, and, and in, 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 in the South, he was saying, you know, please keep your expectations down. You may have achieved your independence, but um, achieving your, 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 your true self-determination, your, your, your freedom, et cetera, is gonna take a lot of work. And to the North, his message was, you may have lost the South, but you are still an African country because Arabs are in Sudan and elsewhere in the African continent are still Africans. And you have to get to, and, and there is a, an African future for Sudan. And he, I mean, he was very regretful about the separation of the South because as a pan-Africanist, he felt African states should be coming together rather than breaking apart. But he said that his, his core, his other message was that if, it is the wish of the Sudanese to, and South Sudanese to, to, to have separate countries, so be it. But let us let them find a way of, of, of actually using that separation to have a more harmonious whole. Now in, so this was the sort of the Pax Africana that was, the, um, the, um, that was building and gathering momentum. And, and yes, you know, it's fragile. Um, the African Union does not have great coercive capacity, but what it does have are the norms and principles which it was uh, applying, and I think to, to moderately good effect. In the Horn of Africa, this was underpinned by what we might call the Pax Ethiopica, 
Now, from um, 1991 until his death in, in 20, 2012, the leader of Ethiopia, the prime minister, was Mamas Sanawi, who um, is a controversial figure. Um, but he, uh, even his detractors will admit, he, he was accomplished at several things. First of all, he was exceptionally smart, as a, sharp as a strategic thinker. And he was able to position Ethiopia as the hub, the anchor of peace and, and, and security in the region. And he did this through a, a mixture of, 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 of means, um, including what he, the developmental state, including uh, the, the rapid economic growth of Ethiopia and its infrastructural integration into all of its neighbors, with the exception of Eritrea, with which it was in a state of Cold War. So that the, the plan was that Ethiopia would be exporting power, would be using the ports of the region, et cetera, et cetera. And that infrastructural integration would, would be the, um, one of the foundations of stability. Um, central to this vision was the development of the power sector, the hydropower sector. And he had the vision of what he called the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And the Renaissance in that was 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 a, a, a gesture towards Tabo Mbeki and the idea of the African Renaissance. And it was both a huge infrastructural project, building this enormous dam, but also a diplomatic project in constructing an alliance of African states to contain Egypt. Because Egypt was, for historical reasons, opposed to dam building on the Nile. And so the in order for Ethiopia to build this dam, which which would supply its own energy needs, drive its, its economic development, and, uh, and in turn would export power to the neighbors and therefore embed them in, 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 in this coalition. It needed a diplomatic strategy, which he was very adept at. And part of that diplomatic strategy was using the Ethiopian National Defense Force as a peacekeeping force. So renting it out, to the United Nations and African Union for peace operations. And these peace operations were partly goodwill, partly a money earn, they got foreign currency, but partly also pursuing the strategic interests of Ethiopia, especially in, 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 in Somalia. And Malice's argument was that the core national security threat to Ethiopia was poverty. Unless Ethiopia could actually be economically viable, sustainable, it would always be at risk of, of being manipulated, overrun by its richer neighbors, especially the Gulf states and Egypt. And if Egypt and the Gulf states got together, I mean, his nightmare was that the Gulf states with their money would follow the Egyptian agenda. So he was trying to, 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 to keep Ethiopia um, out of that, uh, out of their grips. And in, uh, I ha held a series of seminars with him in which we discussed many issues and we disagreed on many issues, particularly on democracy. His argument was that essentially that democracy in Ethiopia should wait, should wait until Ethiopia had developed, which I did not agree with. But um, nonetheless, we, we, he was somebody with whom you could have quite a productive argument. Um, um, his view and, 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 and the, um, the political marketplace as, as, a, as, as a transactional system of trading in, in, uh, in loyalties, political services, uh, uh, a sort of updated monetized form of neo-patrimonialism. He saw as, 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 as the sort of the functioning of the archetypical African state. And one of the, the questions that I had for him, and we never got, because he died, we never got to, to conclude this discussion, was how is Ethiopia going to manage the challenge of the marketization of politics as we see in countries like um, Sudan and Somalia, where everything is up for sale, including political office, political allegiance, um, and security, etc. cetera. How is, it, how is Ethiopia going to maintain its institutions and promote democracy with this challenge and we we never got to uh, an answer or indeed to an agreement on this 
Um, but nonetheless, I would argue that as of, let us say, five, six years ago, what we had in the Horn of Africa was a, a situation in which you could see the beginnings, or, or, or more than the beginnings, the maturation of a set of norms and institutions and economic interests that was stabilizing the region. And they were stabilizing it around the, 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 these practices of conflict resolution and governance um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the interdependencies that would emerge from economic growth and the, the development of, of governing institutions, especially in Ethiopia. Now, what we've seen in the last few years is this has unraveled. So let me start with Sudan and South Sudan. Um, the, the unraveling of this essentially came about because of the mismanagement and the economic crisis that resulted from the separation of South Sudan. Because the, from approximately 1999 to 2011, which was the separation of South Sudan, there was an oil boom in Sudan. Unprecedented wealth flew into the country, um, flowed into the country. And on that basis, the ruling elites, especially Omar al-Bashir, but also Salvatore in South Sudan, established a highly monetized, very lucrative patrimonial system that was also a kleptocracy. And Bashir was very skillful at, at, at managing the funds that came in in order to, to, to rent and buy the loyalties of, of the intermediate elites and keep the system running. But it required three things to run. It required considerable skills, and Bashir was actually very skillful. It required money. And um, at least Bashir was tactically skilled. Uh, strategically, he had major shortcomings, which I will get on to. And it required a, a, an acceptance of the political elites of certain norms. And the essential norm here is one of um, recognizing that by the same token that, that, that uh, today's friend can be tomorrow's enemy, today's enemy can be tomorrow's friend. It's a very turbulent system. This a transactional system is, is, is very, is, it's always changing. There's a joke about Sudan. It changes every week. Politics changes every week. You go back after 10 years and it's just the same. So it's a very turbulent system because the, you know, like a retail market, you know, the prices rise and fall, the you know, commodities change, but the structure re remains roughly the same. Um, and the Sudanese, especially the Northern Sudanese political elite had a, a sort of norm of courtesy and, and, and tolerance that allowed the system to function relatively well. Now, Bashir's key problem, immediate problem after the secession of the South was he lost most of his money. He lost the oil. And he, and he had the misfortune of having a windfall of gold at the same time. And, and it was a misfortune because the gold was in the peripheries and was artisanal gold, and it was controlled by militia. So those militia, especially a militia, are called the Rapid Support Forces, run by a fellow called General Mohammed Hamdan Hamdi, became very powerful because they controlled the gold. <coughs> um, and in order for the for Bashir and his the people around him to get his, the, enough to extract enough resources out of that gold, which is and gold is easily smuggled, they needed the Sudanese state to buy it. And in order for them to buy it, they paid above the international market price with Sudanese currency, which was inflationary. So, they, so the inflation eroded the living standards of the people who lived in the cities, the, the, the salaried class, and it transferred money to these, these militia vagabonds who were roaming around Darfur. So, um, The, and the management, the style of management of Bashir, which is one of paying off 
every member of the provincial elite, every militia member, then came back to haunt him. This happened in two stages. The first was the independence of South Sudan, um, because the war in South Sudan over many years was fought not primarily by the Sudanese army, but principally by paid militias in South Sudan. And the moment those paid militias got a better deal, a better offer from the South Sudanese government in Juba, they switched. And, they, and, and then the independence of South Sudan was a done deal. And then similarly, the other thing that came back to haunt him was the, the use, the support of these militia in Darfur, both for counterinsurgency and then his reliance on them for controlling the gold. And it was when this, this paramilitary commander, Hemeti, brought his troops to Khartoum and said at the crucial moment in, 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 in 2019, I will stand with the revolution, with the protesters on the street, and Bashir was finished. So it, it's an indication of how um, the, the way of style of managing a complex country using bribery, using coercion in a systematic manner is a Ponzi scheme, which will collapse at some point. And it collapsed and, and, and Bashir was overthrown. <coughs> the hybrid civilian military government that was then in place for two and a bit years until October 25th was trying to dig its way out of this hole. The coup of October 25th staged by General Al-Burhan was essentially a kleptocrat's coup. It is an aimless coup. The only aim of the Bashir and his generals was to protect the exorbitant privileges they had as the leaders of the military, number one, in a bloated military budget, and number two, in, in, in their deep penetration of the commercial sector. And that was under threat because of the, the, the anti-corruption activities of the civilian government. Um, because time is pressing, I'm actually going to jump over Somalia, but we could do it in the Q&A and go straight into to Ethiopia. Um, um, in, when I was writing my book, Real Politics of Horn of Africa, as I mentioned, I explored the possibility that Ethiopia was going to be the counterexample to the political marketplace. It was going to be the state that was the institutionalized state that escaped from the fragility trap. It hasn't happened. What went wrong? And, um, and I think we need to ask a number of questions. One, the, the obvious one, and the one that you know, was, was my, my longstanding debate and disagreement with the late Mela Sinawi was that you couldn't postpone democratization, as he argued. Um, he argued that basically Ethiopia had to become middle income before it became democratic. <coughs> and I said, this is too much of a gamble. Um, and basically wrong. Um, was there or was there another failing in that system? And, and I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, I think there was a, a, a failing in that in the rush for growth, Actually, the, um, there was an attempt to, to create, as it were, a depoliticized political sphere. And the, um, one of the things that struck me in, in, in meeting with Mellis and, 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 and his cabinet about um, 10, 11 years ago, was that they were largely technocrats rather than politicians schooled in hard knocks. And um, that was worrying because they, they were not accustomed to the type of you know, real hard political work, hard political discourse that would be necessary to run Ethiopia. And that made, uh, it, it was a deep vulnerability. Um, the, um, there was a key moment, there was a chance, I think, 
for Ethiopia. And uh, the chance came in 2018 when the then ruling party began to reform. And the ruling party itself, the EPIDF, became the forum for, um, for political discourse. But it didn't last long. And it didn't last long because they were both the new prime minister, Abi Ahmed, and um, some of the others were in a rush to resolve things too quickly rather than waiting for the, 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 the political discussions to play out. <clears throat> and I'm afraid the Nobel Prize award to, to Abiy Ahmed was a calamitous error because it gave him the self-confidence to feel that he was um, invulnerable, that he could, he could do what he liked. And Abiy really became, if he wasn't when he began, he became the transactional politician par excellence, believing that everything was there to be, uh, to be bargained rather than to be negotiated. Um, the difference being bargaining is, 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 is finding the price which is required for people to cooperate, negotiation being addressing the issues. He was much, he became too impatient to get into the negotiation. And he overpromised. He promised everything to everybody. And then when he realized he couldn't deliver, he had to decide whom to disappoint. And, the, and he decided, first of all, to disappoint the, the democracy movement that had brought him to power, this mass movement of, of disaffected um, youth, especially from the, the, the aroma of the center and south, who had challenged the, the EPIDF state as, as being um, uh, corrupt, as being, as, as being repressive, and, 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 forced it, and, and forced it to reform. So he, he, he threw them out, and then he turned against the Tigrayans. And, the, and, and, and here we begin to see the real unraveling of the Pax Africana and the Pax Ethiopica. And you see it in two things, which at the time were seen as breakthroughs. The first was when Abiy, on the instructions of the ruling party, went to Asmara, to Eritrea, to make a peace deal with Isaias Afawaki, the longstanding dictator of Eritrea. And this was what actually got him the Peace Prize. And um, according to the principles of the Pax Africana, what Abbey should have done was he should first of all have come back to the African Union as the custodian of that peace agreement, because it was, the, it was actually then the OAU, but it became the AU, but it was actually the one that facilitated it back in 2000, and said, here we are. And they in turn would have said, okay, what are the metrics for monitoring and, and implementing this? Where is the democratization? Where is the disarmament and demobilization? Where is the, the monitoring of, of opening the border? He didn't do any of that. Instead of that, the actual content of the agreement was kept a secret between him and his sayers. And they went for two signing ceremonies. The first was in Abu Dhabi, and the second was in Jeddah. And, the, and, and this was part of the, the, the financial and hence political subordination of Ethiopia and Eritrea to the, the financial, uh, to the marketplace of, of, of the Gulf, the political marketplace of, of, of the Gulf states. And then as time went on, it became clear that the, that the, the deal, the secret deal was a security pact to make war against Tigray and also a, a, a financial pact whereby the, 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 the Gulf investors would get sweet deals in terms of providing all sorts of things to Ethiopia, including arms, and also in return getting very good deals on, on, on buying privatized um, Ethiopian businesses. Um, the second step that, 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 that Abbey took, and this was immediately in the weeks after he got his Nobel Prize, was he went to Russia. He went to the summit in, in Sochi in, 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 in Russia, and there he met uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the, the, the president of Egypt, one-on-one. -on -one. And he basically said to al-Sisi, let's make a deal, bilateral deal on the Nile, and we will bring in the Americans as, 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 as the facilitator. And the foreign minister at the time was so horrified that he hadn't been invited. Um, 
that he threatened to resign because essentially what 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 um, Abby was doing was putting all his cards on the table and saying to Alcisi, you, you just pick your whichever ones you want. And he, and and of course, you know, the Trump administration was going to side with 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 Al Sisi, and the Sudanese, having no option but to side with Egypt and the U.S., went on that side too. So the the the, the whole that complex diplomatic structure that had been constructed, first of all by Malice, then by his successors, dissolved. And then, and then after that, um, um, Abi was forced to to retreat. And, 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 and became um, uh, angry and paranoid about the, 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 the mistake that he himself had made. And he compounded that mistake then by going to war with, 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 um, with, with Tigray, really um, on, in, 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 in partnership with, 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 with Isaias. And responsibility for that war is shared. It's not. It wasn't. I mean, obviously, the plan was hatched in in, in Asmara, but the 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 um, the Tigrayan leadership was extremely feckless and irresponsible, and 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 and, and you know, has has it has its share of responsibility for the outbreak of that war. But where um, where Abbey went peculiarly wrong was in deciding to fight the war as a war against the people, a war of systematic atrocity. The Tigrayans call it genocide. And I think they are probably right. You know, mass rape, you know, deliberate starvation, massacre. Not all on one side, but overwhelmingly on the side of the Ethiopian and Eritrean forces. And that broke the state. It broke the army. Now, we, you know, we know from you know, Charles Tilly, et cetera, that the War makes the state as the state makes war. And nowhere is this more true than in a country like Ethiopia. And the, the, the army, any army ordered to, 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 to commit systematic atrocities of this nature will break. And that's what happened. Whereas the Tigrayans faced with collective annihilation rallied to the Tigray Defense Forces, which are not the same as the TPLF. It's actually led by non-TPLF generals. And most of the recruits were not TPLF. And they, in this astonishing feat of arms, actually defeated the, the Ethiopian army, drove them out of Tigray. But rather than admit defeat, Abi rallied. But the force that he has rallied, which, I mean, he's twice he's done it. The first time he did it, after being driven out of Tigray, he rallied in July and August. And he rallied not an army, but an assemblage of the remnants of his army. They had still some intact divisions. He lost about half of it. Ethnic militia, special forces, and some, some high-tech drones and things. They were defeated again in a terrible battle of about a month ago. Tens of thousands of young people killed. And these are astonishingly large and bloody battles. The two grounds won again. And now he's doing the same. He's this time a, a, a sort of citizen's army, but an ethnic citizen's army based in mobilization of the youth of Addis Ababa. And it is frankly terrifying to see the, the, the hate speech, the mass detention of people of Tigrayan ethnicity and the um, you know, mobilization to defend the city at, at, at all costs. And just, to, I mean, if I may, may have a, just a couple more minutes, <clears throat> um, the, the current situation is that the, the Tigray Defense Forces have won a decisive military victory. On the battlefield, they have won and Abbey has lost. And with that, Abbey's dream of sort of reconstituting an imperial state is dead. The Tigrayans do not have a political program. The TPLF leadership is likely to lose the peace that the Tigray Defense Forces have won because they have not made it clear what they want to do. They are not liked. They are not, even within Tigray, they are not liked. And especially outside Tigray, they are not liked. The state that Abbey is, 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 is creating is in the image of this, this army, this, this assemblage of remnants of professional army, ethnic militias, you know, youth in and out of uniform, etc. 
and 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 it is essentially a a, a, a failed state that is that, that that is that he is recreating. But of course, if you look back in history, and you look back to imperial Ethiopia, back in in, in the eighteenth and nineteenth century, that's what Ethiopia looked like. So if if he was if 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 that is what he was dreaming of. He is actually you know, create, recreating the Ethiopia of the past, which is a, a, a particularly, um, uh, for it's the people who live there, particularly unpleasant um, experience. So um, the, um, we can talk about this maybe, but there are attempts to diplomatically to resolve the crises, both in Sudan and, and Ethiopia, and also in Somalia, which, is, which is, has its own particular dynamics as well. And the United States is really at the forefront of those, but it's, um, it's all looking uh, pretty precarious. And as I would said at the beginning, I think what this really represents throughout is the triumph of transactional politics, a very violent, mercenarized political marketplace at the expense of politics of institutions, norms, and principles. Okay, Alex, uh, thanks very much. What a thoughtful reflection is this? Obviously, we ask after Pax Ethiopica, what? With the collapse of leading forces, both Abi and Tigre um, and Pax Africana unraveling in the process or losing its, uh, its grip. Um, uh, thanks very much. Please, colleagues, um, would you come in? Um, Wish your wish your questions or comments, Jan. Yeah, if I I could, uh, Alex, amazing talk. Wow, you you really understand what's going on there, and it doesn't look good. Uh, I'm struck by how transactional approaches to diplomacy, rather than combination of relational and transactional, do not end well. And as Jan was alluding to. Uh, where is this going to go? Is there any hope for the people? And I'm also curious about your work on pandemics and earlier work on famines, how it, th that might be tied in here with all this too. And whose money is behind all this? Okay. Um, yeah, shall I take questions one at a time or shall I? Oh, yes, please. Uh, okay. I don't okay. see other, other hands at the moment. Thanks. Okay. Um, whose money is behind it? I think the, I mean, the, there is some, I mean, it, there is some private sector money behind Abbey, but the, the, the private sector money is terrified, actually, because the US is threatening sanctions. And Abbey says, oh, we can go to China and Russia, but the businessmen know that that's not a really an option, especially as many of them have businesses here in, in, in the US. There has been some Gulf money behind it in the early days, but the the Emiratis in particular realized, oh, we have, well, this is not what we, we didn't understand that it was gonna, this was what was gonna happen. They, 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 they've been very naive um, in, 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 in going in, in, in that direction. In terms of famines, um, the, I mean, I've been working on famines since the 1980s and, and especially in the last few years working on developing the framework to understand famine as a crime, you know, starvation crimes. And in fact, I'm just co-editing a, a book on, with a bunch of lawyers on, 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 on uh, how, how we could get accountability for famine crimes. Uh, and the, um, and in, you know, having, studied famines you know they this and how, how shall i put this okay two things first of all in in nearly 40 years of studying famines this is the one that is the most deliberate and systematic attempt at mass starvation that has happened in the time that i've been studying this 
you probably have to go back to World War II to see such a sustained attempt to reduce a population to utter destitution and starvation. Um, uh, the, one of the striking things about it is not only has no food or I mean, there hasn't been a single international aid delivery into Tigray for more than three weeks. Um, the amount of aid that was supposed to go in from, according to the United Nations, all provided for, I mean, it's, it's not that there has been a funding shortage between um, 28th of June when the Ethiopian army withdrew and, and today, it's about something like 10 or 11% of what was supposed to go in. So you have 5 million people needing food aid. At that time, in, in, in late July, um, according to different estimates, between 400,000 and 900,000 in famine conditions. In the meantime, no information has come out. No surveys have been done. And the UN, to its eternal shame, has not insisted on information being collected and has not blown the whistle. And the, there was a, there's a thing called the Famine Review Committee, which is an independent expert group that was convened in June, and they developed scenarios. And the worst case scenario of their four scenarios has played out. And under that, they said there will be widespread famine by the end of September. We're now in early October, in early November. And how there could be anything other than widespread famine. And yet the UN is still using the same figures that it was using in June. It is shocking. Um, um, the, um, where is this going to end? I, what I hope in the Ethiopian case is that the, the constitution um, with that remarkable vision of Ethiopia as a coming together of different nations and nationalities can be the basis for, for, for a political settlement. Please, um, Kay Taylor. Thanks so much, Alex, for a, a really great and sobering presentation. Um, to follow up on, on one of David's questions and your comments around aid and famine, uh, if there was the possibility of getting aid to Tigray, um, is there still the same sort of Tigrayan NGO relief infrastructure that was developed in the 1980s? I know Abi was also trying to delegitimize uh, Tigray and NGOs. So if things start to open up, is there still local infrastructure um, organizationally in Tigray? And then one other question that I'm a bit curious about, you know, you mentioned the, the fear of sanctions among the business community supporting Abi. Um, and so, you know, from your own work, some of your work with Ben Spatz, if we see sanctions intervening in the political marketplace within Ethiopia um, and for you know, the government and their supporters, does someone step in to push Abi out? Um, what's sort of the ways that the game might change if sanctions are leveled on the government? Thanks. Um uh, Alex, would you like to combine this with a question from Mark Duffield? Mark, please. Your sound. Yeah, mine's um, a, a bit different to that. I, I don't know if Alex would want to comment okay. to that one directly. All right, so please, Alex, back to you. Okay, so on the local infrastructure, there, I think there is enough there um there it's 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 i mean not what it was but there um there is enough and there, and the a lot of that sense of solidarity has been reborn um out of uh, out of the current you know the current calamity um 
In terms of sanctions, I think the there is a uh, they um, a couple of things. One is Abby has been very effective at mobilizing anti-US sentiment in 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 the, well in Addis Ababa at any rate. Um, and but nonetheless, they are much more frightened of sanctions than they let on. Um, and the way these targeted sanctions work is by stealth. So that uh, it, 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 because the, these transactions go through, so many transactions go th are denominated in US dollars and go through US banks. If the, let's say the, the embassy in Washington wants to hire a public relations firm, that public relations firm you know, might submit its invoice and then suddenly, you know, it finds that it can't be paid because that bank account has been frozen. Or, you know, they're buying drones from Turkey and suddenly the Turkish company discovers or the, the, the British supplier of weapon systems to this Turkish company finds that its invoice isn't being paid because it's been targeted. And so they're actually a lot more afraid of it. And this is why if you see, if you follow the Security Council carefully, you will see that um, the, uh, the Russians in particular absolutely are adamant there must, sanctions are no, they, this is the one thing they lobby on everywhere. Not so much because they're worried about Ethiopia or indeed about Sudan, but they're worried about them, themselves. Please, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, a great talk. Um, it's full of so many um, interesting and, and, and challenging ideas. Um, I, I just wanted, I, th I think that where I'd like to sort of get to is, you know, what, what's a valid response to transactional politics or, or what's wrong with perhaps existing responses? I mean, uh, what I kind of take away from, from your presentation or how I would situate it is that since the 1990s, especially the 2000s, especially since the, the failure of the neocon invasions within the greater Middle East, um, there's been a kind of Western retreat. You know, we, we can see this in the aid world, the bunkerization of aid. But you prevent, you present, I think, a very interesting comment on that retreat that it's 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 not a vacuum it's also a pushback where you're having this regional forces regional attempts to govern diversity to try to um, see that as a major challenge of the age which it is um, which would situate the horn of africa as um, certainly at the center of contemporary politics and the descent of these regional attempts at governing diversity into transactional politics, again, is reflecting the, I think, the moves in the West towards populism, the Trump government, Johnson, and so on. Um, and I think the problem, I think, for the North or for progressives or the left is how to frame a response to that and and what i'd like to just do is you know like put a bit of historical dimension on this go back to the the liberation struggle in eritrea and tigray in the well beginning in the 70s ending in the early 90s um yeah i was an active member of the Eritrea Support Committee and the Tigray Support Committee in the early 80s, involved in organizing collections of money, collections of blankets, um, school books and so on. And the left at the time framed these struggles within the framework of national liberation. And it was a, a way of approaching these studies and then these struggles. And then with the, the emergency relief desk, based in Khartoum in the 1980s. One, that, that dialogue of um, national liberation um, was still possible. 
And then if we come forward now to the present period, all that material reality is gone. It's just disappeared. It's no longer possible to run a cross-border operation from Sudan into Tigray. Um, within the West, there's been people commenting the, the death of internationalism. Um, in fact, in Britain now, it's almost as if it's uh, uh, anti-patriotic to engage in international solidarity work and so on. A completely different material reality. But what we seem to have, re what seems to have replaced that, that national liberation struggle rhetoric, which was a way of engaging with the politics, is the kind of human rights abuse, human rights uh, approach in which we sit now see these uh, struggles on a, a continuum between worse or better or uh, you know more extreme forms of of um, of atrocity or uh, uh, genocidal approaches. But that dialogue doesn't seem to engage with people on the ground. I think uh, what also seems to be happening, uh, the, the material reality uh, has changed since the 80s. And what in the region you have a growth of a, uh, relatively a growth of a, 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 a regional middle class. And I think you've, you've got the emergence of nationalism, forms of nationalism within the horn that are supporting Abbey and um, uh, other forces. And I think the limitations of the kind of human rights approach now is it, it doesn't engage with these groups. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's seen as a, um, or experienced as a, an ideolo ideology of uh, intervention. There's no traction in terms of political dialogue. And so, you know, I mean, what my question is, is how do we, what sort of politics now is necessary or political and get forms of engagement or dialogue that we can actually get traction with, with the, 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 uh, the forces driving transactional politics, forms of engagement, not simply forms of confrontation which, which I think we're, we're at an impasse, if you like. Um, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm just kind of like, it's rather a, a complicated intervention, um, just trying to give some historical depth to it. But also I think the limitations now of, um, of how one can, uh, you know, how forces, progressive forces can actually engage with these situations and not falling into forms of further polarization and accused of one-sidedness and you know which are and I don't think the human rights dialogue really works in terms of furthering them thanks thanks Mark uh, Sean Kevin are your questions parallel to this one no? Sean my more dovetail into domestic politics uh, on a similar theme but I think it's better to deal with the international community first Oh, please, Alex, over to you. Mm, Mark, there's a, as always, very thought provoking comments. And I think there, I mean, I, let me just make a couple of points because I, you know, um, it, 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 it really warrants a much more it, a conversation on its own, your, your points. Um, the, um, with regard to the situation in Ethiopia, just a couple of some random thoughts. The first is that you know the Tigray resistance should correctly be framed within just war theory. When people are faced with genocide, as they were, what option do they have but to resist by force of arms? And 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 really, I, I would like to see a just war theorist get to grips with that. And, and, and the, the converse side of that is an unjust war and, and, and how it is, you know, what it means politically for a 
a, a, a state or a society to engage in a war that is so manifestly unjust. The court, the, you know, let us leave aside actually the causes of the war, but the actual conduct of the war and the, con, and, and the rationale for resisting it. But, you know, um, and the total absence of any just war theorization. And in fact, insofar as I've raised this, people recoil. They, you know, they think, oh, we, we, we can't go there. There's no way we can go there. The second interesting observation is that, you know, if you follow the, the media or the diplomatic exchanges, you know, there have been over the last few months, um, there have been probably a dozen incidents in which anywhere between 20 and 100 civilians have been killed or in some cases raped. And these tend to get, you know, full length articles, etc. There have been battles, there have been a series of battles in which probably 30, 40, 50,000 young people have lost their lives. There's not been a single article a single expression of diplomatic concern about this loss of life, especially, you know, um, when, you know, they involve human wave assaults, like we saw, you know, the Soviets doing in World War II or the Iranians in the Iran-Iraq war. And, and they've gone totally unnoticed. And that is also very, very striking and odd. Another element in this is Pentecostalism. And the, uh, because Abby, along with a number of others, including many of his international friends, are, are, are devout Pentecostalists. And it's very striking. I've read Abby's PhD thesis, which he didn't write. He was written for him. He was basically, a, a, he's a fraudulent PhD. But there's one element in it, which is the, which, which he did write, which is, the, his, a, a little vignette that he had from his own personal experience of how, how um, a conflict in the town of Jimmer in southern Ethiopia was settled between was between a religious it was a Muslim and Christian groups, and it came down to the 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 sheikh and the priest riding around on the same motorbike, and and every and and Abi's whole approach to vision of peace is it comes down to personal relationships. And, 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 and that reflects a sort of that, you know, that, that Pentecostalist thing. Um, and then the last point on, on, on Sudan, which is that, you know, we have, we've been so impressed by the civic resistance, by the non-violent civic resistance of the Sudanese protesters. And we love it and quite right too. You know, it's heartwarming. But the, the, the idealism of those, you know, civilian protesters and the political leaders have led to a situation of totally unrealistic demands about how governance should be structured, including ignoring some basic realities about how rural society is, is, is run, which have contributed to the problems and indeed to the, the coup. I mean, the coup is, is the work of the, of, 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 of the military apparatus, but the um, the military say, the General Al-Bahan said, well, it was the civilians that caused the coup, which is 99% a lie, but 1% true. Please, uh, thanks. Please, Sean, Kevin, would you combine the questions? Sean. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Alex, for a great presentation. Uh, as always, nice to see you, Sean. Yeah, Alex, yeah, yeah, nice to see you. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future, uh, about the structural issues facing uh, state building in Ethiopia. Um, and uh, of course, we can all have a different opinion about the EPRDF project up till 2018 or up until uh, the death of Melis. Um, but I think clearly uh, it had its flaws, it had its uh, risks that were not being very well managed by the leadership or it had its in, uh, internal, uh, internal weaknesses. Um, today it seems like perhaps a little oversimplistic, but I think still valid to say that the, the clash of visions is between the ethno-nationalists or ethno-federalists and the, uh, the pan-Ethiopianists. Uh, pan um, uh, and of course, it's been, uh, it seems to be very much a, uh, you know, a win-lose uh, uh, proposition right now. 
I just like to get your views to explain why Ethiopian political elites have failed to get past that either or uh, 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 disposition, and if you see any uh, any uh, seeds of uh, people of some kind of institutional response or some kind of individual response or any kind of response to get past that either or disposition. Gavin, please. Thanks. I'm afraid is 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 no. I don't really see um, any 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 willingness to think creatively. And in fact, I mean, one of the many ironies is that the idea that Abby had of Medema, which was a, it, which is a sort of coming together, was supposed to bridge that gap. And it and it had the it had the attraction of being under theorized of being really empty of content, so it could have been the focus of some quite creative discussion. But it it it, it but Abby, because of his own personal shortcomings, came to identify it with whatever he happened to believe in, um, and, and 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 it died a death. But I think. It's interesting, just at the moment, there are quite a lot of different ideas being put forward. I mean, I just was reading today some, some something that is being drafted by an Aromo group. And they, um, and what we tend to see is, um, is a rush towards sort of a, a, a legalistic precision of, you know, defining the formula that can take Ethiopia forward rather than saying let us live with the reality of an unsettlement of, a, of an unresolved issues that we're going to have to debate over a, a, a period of time which I think could allow for um, a the, the development the exploration of ideas that could bridge the the, you know, the very polarized uh, different uh, viewpoints that exist in Ethiopia at the moment. Please, uh, Kevin Danico, Kevin. Sound. Yeah, just very quick because the time is getting short of great presentations and great discussion from several people. I'll, could you just, Alex, could you say a little more about how you see the situation in Sudan, what's happening right now? what you think will happen, and especially in light of, I mean, you posed it, I thought, in terms of that the, maybe the opposition was too, or the democratic movement was too aggressive, but in light of what Mark was saying, I mean, this fetish of both nonviolence and human rights doesn't seem to be very successful against these kinds of regimes, military security states, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Syria, you know, as long as that army and security apparatus stays there, aren't they going to just eventually come back in some form, no matter how, what, what agreements they make? Yeah, no, I, um, I, when the coup, okay, when, when the coup was mounted, October 25th, my immediate thought was this coup can be reversed. It's not a, it, it's not a done deal. Um, it was a coup lacking in confidence, lacking in a, a support outside, beyond the army itself. Even the, the, the sort of the, the usual suspects who support authoritarians, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and, and in this case, Israel, because Israel is involved, um, seemed to be lukewarm. And the, the street was out immediately. I mean, people saw through it immediately. You know, there, 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 there was no... In, in, in the past, in coups, there's been a con, in Sudan, there's been a constituency, a civilian constituency that says, yeah, we're with these guys, either because we want a strong leader or because we believe in the ideological project. In this case, none. The, the, the civilian population of the cities, at any rate, united against it. Um, and very vulnerable for financial reasons. Two reasons. One is that that Yes, the Emiratis and the Saudis have got a lot of money, but they, they're not going to have the billions needed or they're not going to be prepared to pay the billions needed to bail out Sudan. You need the Americans and the, and the um, HIPEC debt relief, et cetera, which the Americans have a veto on to go ahead. And also because these, these kleptocrats are very vulnerable to targeted sanctions. So I thought, okay, this, this coup is not a done deal. And indeed, 
as recently as this weekend, it looked as though there was a that there was an agreement to reinstitute the civilian government of Abdullah Hamdok with a few cosmetic reforms, which were a face saving device for the military. The last moment, Al Burhan backed out. And he's putting himself in a corner where um, his strategy will either be repression, um, which is surely unsustainable, or um, he will continue to ride the, the, you know, the declining economy to a point at which Sudan is prostrate. And he says, look, you have to support me because the alternative is worse. Um, it's, it's really a, it's, it's, it's a dead end coup in, in, in every way, apart from the fact that, um, you know, that, that, that you have a leader who could hold the whole of Sudan hostage and say, please bail me out because the alternate, or we all go down together. Um, uh, and and it's still, I mean, it, it, it could go either way, you know, it's not, it, it is still not a done deal, although I'm afraid the, the best chance of reversing it seems to have slipped away. Uh, please, uh, Nico and then Ron, would you combine questions? Nico, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so... Uh, I was, and I first want to say that it was a great talk. I found it very interesting. Um, and uh, I was in Addis from in 2017 to 2018. Um, and the events that have unfolded in the last two years aren't very surprising um, from what I saw from my time there. Um, but as someone who's uh, starting their career in this field, um, I guess my question is, what path can we go? Because I don't think this will be the uh, the last conflict in the Horn of Africa. Uh, I know it won't be. Um, even if this is resolved, there will be another one later on. Um, and you know, uh, I guess my question is, what path should someone such as myself go down um, to try and at least come up with some to be part of some sort of resolution, solution, idea to this, or is just we think reporting on it and trying to bring attention to it, the, the best that we can do for now. You talked a little bit answering someone else's questions of, do we live with the result of just, do we just live with this is how Ethiopia is, or do we attempt to try and come up with some sort of solution? Because it isn't just Ethiopia, you know, it's the entire region. There, there will be, it's Ethiopia now, and it will be, you know, Somalia later, it's Somalia, it's Somalia now, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess that, that's my question. Thanks, Nico. Please, Ron. Yeah, my question is a little different, but Please. what role, if any, is the U.S. playing in this conflict and with also consideration of conflict with China? And also in terms of the appropriateness of the U.S. imposing unilateral sanctions uh, in light of the fact that According to international law, that's a violation of international law, even though we want to see something to do to be done to stop the war crimes that are being committed on both sides. Thanks. Alex, please. Okay, so um, career advice. I think there is a, there, there is a um, the practices of conflict resolution and engagement in, the, in, 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 in these types of situations are enormously important and, and, and fruitful and can be engaged in. I think, I mean, for me, um, the, the, the efforts from below of, of sort of local people, of civil society activists, of um, I mean, really interesting cases in South Sudan of, of judicial activists, local magistrates, judges, actually creating law, creating order from below are hugely important. So I think though, you know, the, that um, the studying those, supporting those is always going to be important. Um, the US role, um, the I think in both Ethiopia and Sudan, the US has actually, or under Biden at any rate, has basically got the right policies. 
um, I, you know, I'd find myself unusually in 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 agreement with what the U.S. is is is, is trying to do. Um, uh, in in both country in both cases, the the mediation strategy of the U.S. has been unusually balanced. It has brought in. Um, um, sorry, my light automatically switches off if I'm <laughs> so I get plunged into darkness. Um, uh, the mediation strategy has also involved key power brokers in the region. So in, in, the, in the Sudanese case, they have involved the Saudis, the Emiratis, um, the African Union. In, in, in the Ethiopian case, they work very closely with the Kenyans. And, and, and actually, I, I, I think they've, generally speaking, done the right thing. Now, the sanctions issue is, um, is, 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 is interesting. Yeah, because uh, in what do you do in a case like Ethiopia, where um, you have a government that is committing the most heinous crimes, including you know organized mass starvation, and the Security Council is paralyzed, um, and the African Union in the case of Ethiopia completely failed, and you know. So does, you know, if the United States does have instruments at its disposal to expose and punish those who are responsible for committing these crimes, should it act even when the, you know, outside the UN Security Council where Russia in particular is, is, is short of veto? And there's no straightforward answer, but my leaning is when the, when the crimes are sufficiently heinous, the answer is yes, the US should do that. You know, and similarly, you know, what Al Burhan has done in, in Sudan is not as heinous, but is but is still, you know, bad. And if if uh, punitive measures against you know the the kleptocrat, autocrat regime that is coming into power are blocked at the UN Security Council. Um, you know, what, what is, you know, where does the, the, the you know, what is the right thing to do? I would ha be hopeful that in the Sudanese case, the, the AU may stand up for its principles and say, as it has done, we are going to debar Sudan until such time as it, it gets back on, 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 on the route to democracy, which would give an opening for um, the US to act in a way that is at least consistent with, with, with what it's requested to do by the AU. Um, in the Ethiopian case, I, I, I think it would have to be unilateral by the US, maybe with the Europeans coming along too. Um, please, here there's a question from uh, Paul Bowles in Canada, has mic issues, so I'll ask it uh, on his behalf, it's in the chat. Uh, Ethiopia has been touted as a developmental state, and there is an urge to an interest to identify non-Asian developmental states. Um, so Paul asks, what then is is the relevance of this category of developmental state if it can be cast aside so effectively by a leadership? I think the, um, I mean, Mellis' view, and he actually expressed this very candidly in the, he wrote a national security paper in 2001, and he basically said uh, that national disintegration cannot be ruled out. And then on, you know, asked about this, said, well, you know, if we can get to 2025 and become a middle income country, we, we may be safe. So the question is, was it unfortunate geographical circumstances, unfortunate timing in that, you know, Ethiopia didn't manage to get on the developmental trajectory when it might have been possible in, the, let's say, the 60s and 70s? Or, you know, was it um, bad leadership? Or, you know, what, what are the reasons why the, 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 um, the experiment fell apart? And I think it's... Um, the, the, you know, it will be, this will be a question for 
scholars of developmental states to 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 interrogate but i think what's what, what's clear is that it was a gamble and would and the other question is would ethiopia have been better off without that gamble <laughs> if it had, if if it had stuck with the more modest goal of of of, of trying to um, achieve um, the kind of of, of um, equilibrium that a number of, of our other African states have achieved with less ambitious goals. Is Rwanda an example of a developmental state somewhat more successful also in COVID? I wonder, I mean, Paul Kagame must be asking the question himself what is there a possibility of transitioning out of a, a highly autocratic developmental state to one that is um, more politically plural and democratic and i'm guessing he's he, the conclusion he's he's drawing is it's going to be staying autocratic profound popular support for his COVID policies, considerable support and great success, relatively speaking. That's, that's true. I mean, in, in, um, in, in 10 years ago in Ethiopia, I mean, everyone would criticize Malice for, for, for his, you know, his uh, record on democracy, um, everyone would say, "We, yeah, we, we support his 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 development policies." And it's it's an age old conundrum. Uh, thanks, Alex. And uh, I think we're many of us are thinking about Mark's question. What platform for international solidarity if human rights turns out too, too feeble a position? So that is a question we remain with. Um, time is up, folks. Um, if there is no other question at this moment, please let us thank Alex for a wonderful presentation. And thank you all. Thanks, everybody. All right, Brad, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks much. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Alex. Um, amazing talk. Uh, so next week, uh, we're going to be hosting Vladimir Hamed Toransky. Um, he's uh, from UCSB Global Studies. He's going to be talking about uh, Muslim return migration from the Middle East to Russia. Um, so hope to see you all next week. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks much, Alex. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it.